Uh, good evening. Welcome to the sixth annual Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Real Estate Awards. My name is Tom Burton. I'll be your MC for, uh, for tonight's activities. So this award, the annual uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Real Estate Award, was established by the Colvin Institute in 2015 to recognize innovative and entrepreneurial real estate professionals in our community. And in keeping with, uh, with the great traditions and legacies around the state of Maryland and the area, uh, from the Inner Harbor to the Wharf, tonight's honorees are pioneers in real estate development, affordable housing, community development, and construction management. And we actually have several uh, previous recipients of the award with us tonight. Uh, I know Scott Plank is here. Or Scott, uh, Scott was a, uh, a recipient in 2017. Um, is, uh, is Julie Smith here? Julie? Uh, but Julie Smith uh, was uh, going to be here. She was a recipient. And uh, Raymond Skinner, Robert Rowe, I think they're here, um, and Blaze Rostello. So if you all would just stand up wherever you are so we could recognize you. Fantastic. Thanks for being here. Um, so I think as we get started, what I'd like to do is make sure we uh, recognize and thank some of the organizations that purchased a table for tonight's event, including the Montgomery County Housing uh, Opportunity Commission, the Bizzuto Group, the Housing Association of Nonprofit Developers, the Women of Color in Community Development, the Makita Group, the Enterprise Community Development Group, Todd Del Tufo, thank you, Todd, um, and the Fidelity National Title Insurance Company. So you should know that the Colvin Institute has had a really terrific year. Uh, many of you are aware of the school's competition win, and I'm going to let uh, Dean Linebow tell you more about that later in some details. But in addition to the competition win, um, the Institute had a lot of really terrific uh, things going on. It was a busy year. Uh, the National Intercollegiate Colvin Case Study Challenge was hosted again this year. This is the fourth year, and they had 26 teams participate from 18 different colleges and universities. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this Colvin Case Study Challenge. It's actually kind of cool. I was a judge for it one year, and I don't know any of you others who were judges this year or in the past. Thank you. Uh, but what, what, what they do is the teams write up a case study about a project in their area, and they present it uh, to a team of judges, and those judges winnow down all of those presentations to a final four, and those four come to campus, and they do kind of an all-day presentation. Uh, so it's a lot of work. It was, it's really terrific, and it's a really uh, special thing that the school uh, and the institute is, is hosting. So this year, Colorado State University won, and they're, in fact, um, the second time that an undergraduate team has made it to the Final Four and has won, won the, uh, the case study challenge. Um, some of you, if you were here earlier, you looked in the lobby, you saw uh, these posters in that sort of round area in the entrance. Um, those are examples of the capstone projects that the, that the students did. So if, you, if you're a part of the program here, you do a capstone where you take a project and you basically prepare a feasibility study for it. It's a lot of work. Um, they have advisors. And by the way, any of you who have ever been advisors to a capstone student, thank you. Um, it's a great learning experience. So you saw really a lot of terrific examples, lots of things around Maryland. I saw two things in Philadelphia, uh, which is, was pretty cool, something in Hoboken, New Jersey. So um, just if you get a chance on your way out, if you didn't get a chance to look at them, you might want to stop by. Um, I'm sure some of you know that uh, they have a fall lecture here, the, the Colvin Institute Fall Lecture Series. And this year, the fall lecture featured uh, Nick Ed Edgelon, Edgelon um, who is a leading expert in retail and shopping centers. And he did a, a lecture on um, e-commerce and how that's affecting retail, which uh, is something we all are thinking about a lot because we're all ordering stuff from Amazon and other places, right? Um, so just a really well attended and, uh, and just a great lecture. And then lastly, you might find it interesting to know that the, um, the Colvin Institute supported a trip to South Africa. So uh, Maria Day Marshall, the director of the Colvin Institute, and Tanya Bonsell, who's the associate director, uh, and by the way, one of my former students, and my favorite, one of my favorite students, she knows that. Uh, uh, Travis, you did a good job too. Um, 
So um, the, they went with a delegation of folks to South Africa. They visited four cities. These were all uh, people associated with uh, housing, affordable housing development, and they, um, they just shared ideas and had a great exchange around uh, best practices and affordable housing. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, there's now going to be a summit in 2020 uh, called the Pan-African Symposium on Housing and Human Settlement uh, that kind of came out of this, this trip. So that sounds like a, a terrific trip. Um, one of the last things I wanted uh, uh, to tell you about is uh, you know, we have three schools here that sponsor or host us uh, for tonight. So the School of Architecture, Preservation, and Planning, um, the school of, uh, school of Business, right, the Smith School of Business, and the Clark School of Engineering. Those are our hosts for, for tonight. And we have two of the deans of those schools with us tonight. Um, and maybe uh, Daryl and Don, if you wouldn't mind coming up here, uh, I think they'd like to welcome you and share a little bit about what's going on uh, around campus. Uh, so this is Dr. Don Linebow, who's the dean of the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, of course, home of the Colvin Institute, and Dr. Daryl Pines, the, uh, the Dean of the Clark School of Engineering. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. So I'm Don Linebaugh, and I'm the very proud Dean of the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, Maryland's Built Environment School. And it's, uh, it's a great evening here together, right? This, this may be the last large gathering <laughs> that we get to have at Maryland. So let's party hardy here tonight, okay, gang? It's great. It's, it's been quite a week already, right? It's, it's big Tuesday tonight. We've been uh, deep in COVID-19 and things that we never imagined we were going to have to do. And Maria asked me to, to tell everybody about something special tonight. We have a great uh, table gift. Uh, that there will be numbers under your plates. Don't, don't look now, okay? But the winner is going to get a five-gallon container of Purell, <laughs> which, which currently is valued on Amazon at $4,000. So it's, it's a big deal. No, it's a big deal. Yeah. So it's great to see everybody here and to celebrate together tonight our exceptional honorees and the significant contributions they've made to the real estate industry. We're so proud to partner with our sister schools, the Smith School of Business and the Clark School of Engineering to host this great event again and to highlight the incredible talent and the rich history that we have here at Maryland and across the region. Tonight, we celebrate all things real estate and I want to take a moment to remind us that Maryland's program is not your grandmother's real estate program. What we have at Maryland is a unique, multidisciplinary real estate program built on the approach of the quadruple bottom line. Financially viable, environmentally respectful, socially responsible, and beautifully designed. Thus, we bring together a wide range of professions engaged in the built environment, from architects to bankers and investors, from contractors and engineers to landscape architects, and from market and analysts and urban designers to planners, property and asset managers, and historic preservationists, least we forget. Um, in short, we work together to bring everyone who leads the way in producing a just, beautiful, and resilient world. We're here this evening to celebrate the accomplishments of our friends and supporters who have distinguished themselves as innovators and entrepreneurs in transforming our built environment in new and creative ways. And I look forward to hearing from each of our distinguished guest speakers and our awardees. Right now, though, can I ask the staff and faculty, and I mean anybody that's taught in our school, of the Colvin Institute for Real Estate and the Real Estate Development Program to please stand for a minute. Any faculty and staff, please stand. Yes. So, so we owe these great Terps uh, a, a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, they provide an extraordinary education and experience for our students uh, every day, day in and day out. So a great thanks to them. 
I also want to thank all of our fearless alumni and students who represent the school so well, both nationally and internationally. In case you missed it, and uh, Tom alluded to it, um, both nationally and internationally, our HUD innovation and affordable housing team just placed in the final four in this year's competition, and they're here with us tonight. Stand up, gang. Thank you. So our students have reached the final four three times since the competition began in 2014, second place in 2016, and first place two years in a row, 2018 and 2019. No pressure on these guys, right? So this is a really big honor for the school, the university, and ultimately a testimony to our continuing success. So thank you guys for what you're doing. At last year's ceremony, I announced that we were hard at work on an undergraduate real estate development major in our school titled Real Estate and the Built Environment. Building on our under undergraduate minor, this new program will embrace our quadruple bottom line approach, integrating real estate and other disciplines in the school, architecture, planning, and preservation to create a truly multidisciplinary focus on real estate practice. And I am very happy to report to you this year that we've received all the necessary approvals for the undergraduate degree program from the University Senate, the President, the Board of Regents, and the Maryland Higher Education Commission. So we are ready to launch the program. So I'm Again, thrilled to have been here with you tonight and for the rest of the evening. I hope you enjoy yourself this evening. And if you haven't already done so, get out your phones and put March the 9th, 2021, uh, no COVID-19s or anything else, the seventh annual gala on your calendar. Um, Interim Dean Ritu Agawal from the Smith School of Business wasn't able to be with us tonight because she had another conflict. Um, and she may be able to join us later in the program. We'll see uh, if she's able to get here. Uh, but now, it is my absolute great pleasure and honor to introduce my great colleague, friend, and ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the University of Maryland, Dr. Darrell Pines. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> so, um, in the spirit of COVID-19, you guys are all violating the social distancing policy of six feet away from your neighbor. Um, Dr. Lowe, President Lowe just sent out an email while we were sitting here and enjoying dinner. Um, and so you guys are all violating the policy. We're all violating the policy. This probably will be the last convened uh, meeting of a large gathering on the university's campus before we enter spring break. But I'm glad you all came tonight, and I'm, I'm really happy. And thank you for the kind uh, words, Don. Um, I'm looking forward, obviously, to leading our great university, right? It's a great university, right? So you know, my name is Daryl Pines. I'm still the dean of the A. James Clark School of Engineering. And obviously, it's my privilege to welcome you all with uh, Don. I do want to acknowledge a few others in the audience. So Scott, please stand up this time since you walked away. Scott Plank, <laughs> give him a round of applause. Uh, Board of Regents member Bob Rausch, Robert Rausch, please stand up. Thank you. I wouldn't be here if Bob didn't vote positively for me from the Board of Regents perspective, so I had to acknowledge him. But also, he's a civil engineer and also an entrepreneur. So, um, and we are here at the sixth annual Innovation and Entrepreneurship Awards to recognize some incredible folks in real estate. This annual event has been an exciting partnership, as you heard from Don, between the Colleges of Architecture, Preservation, and Planning, and Engineering and Business. We are all fortunate that what brings us here together are these are excellent schools, but also we stand on the shoulders of incredible giants, and I just want to highlight a few. John Colvin, 
who launched a few years back this Colvin Institute for Real Estate Development, or Mr. Robert H. Smith, who named the Smith School of Business and who was a giant in the DMV region in development, numerous, developing numerous signature properties, including the property that would now house and build out Amazon headquarters too. Edward St. John, who has been one of the region's biggest developers, especially out of Baltimore, and gave a gift to name the Ed St. John Teaching and Learning Center in the middle of our great campus to inspire innovations in education and learning for our students. And of course, I would be remiss if I don't say A. James Clark, whose firm Clark Construction could argue has built DC, including Nationals Park, FedEx Field, the African American Museum, and the Inner County Connector. Where would we be without those things? Or Christine Murden, formerly a Clark School civil engineer who served as the acting architect of the Capitol over the last couple of years. Thus, we at Maryland should embrace this history and these legendary figures in our community. Hence, it is fitting that we bring our disciplines together tonight to recognize innovative and entrepreneurial leaders in real estate for their contribution to our community and most importantly to society. Tackling the extraordinary challenges of the 21st century requires individuals adept at creative problem solving, collaboration, and innovative thinking. The visionaries honored here tonight not only embody that spirit, they set an example of the, for transformative impact that inspires our students and our faculty into the future. So I'm delighted to be here tonight to welcome all of you to this wonderful event. It's the sixth time I've been here. I won't be dean next time. Somebody else will be here. But um, I, I'll try to come back as president and to welcome everyone again. So thank you for letting me be here. Don and Daryl, thank you very much. At uh, this time, I would like to invite Maria Day Marshall to come up to, uh, to the stage. As you know, Maria is the director of the Colvin Institute. Good evening. Good evening. What a week we have had. <laughs> And I am so glad, I'm so glad that you all came out to join us uh, today to celebrate our honorees. Um, and I tell you, um, had it not been for Dean Pines uh, and Dean Linebaugh, we probably would not be here today uh, having this celebration. So I just want to thank you um, for pushing this through. Um, you all are all fearless. I mean, you came out, <laughs> uh, even though we've had this coronavirus and, uh, and joined us tonight, and I just want to thank you so much for, for really supporting the Colvin Institute. I also want to thank the late John Colvin and his wife Karen for their generosity in supporting the Real Estate Development Program and the Colvin Institute of Real Estate Development. Without their commitment to the program, events like this just would not be possible. I want to congratulate our honorees for the significant contributions they have made to the real estate industry. Finally, um, I just want to, I've been working with the HUD competition team um, for many, many years, and I've got to just say um, personally that I'm so proud of these young people. They work so hard. Uh, to get to the competition finals, and um, yeah, it, it takes a lot of work, and you know, they've been working since December, uh, when everybody else was on vacation, they were here working, and so um, I just know that they're going to win again, so let's give them a hand. So now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our keynote presentation. And there are no two better speakers to discuss innovation and real estate development than our guests, Leslie Hale and Ron McDonald. Ron is managing principal of RMC Development, LLC. He's an accomplished real estate executive with more than 26 years of industry experience. 
He has served as a senior VP of Mesro Financial in Chicago and was a vice president with Jones Lang LaSalle. He holds a bachelor's degree from the U.S. Naval Academy and a Master of General Administration from the University of Maryland, Go alum. He's also a decorated U.S. Navy veteran, so we should give him a hand just for his service. <laughs> We've been so fortunate uh, at the UMD's Real Estate Development Program to have Ron as a lecturer, where he has taught two very important classes for several years. Leslie is the president and CEO of RLJ Lodging Trust, a leading hotel real estate investment trust. She is the first African-American woman to serve in this position at a publicly traded REIT. So, all right, Leslie. She was a high achieving student. She earned a bachelor's in business administration from Howard University at the very top of her class and a master in business administration from Harvard Business School where she was a Goldman Sachs and Togo fellow. Leslie is a mother of four young children, four. So I can't wait to hear about her journey to the top and how she manages to do it all. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ron McDonald and Leslie Hale. Leslie and I have been friends for many years. We go back about 20 years. Uh, colleagues, uh, we've sat on boards together. Uh, we actually had a common mentor, uh, the late Alan Braxton, who uh, very accomplished real estate executive. Great man, uh, godfather to my daughter. I was godfather to his daughter. Um, and uh, great friend uh, to both of us. Talk a little bit about uh, Compton, California. You're a California native. Um, what's it like, Leslie Hale, as growing up in Compton, California? <laughs> it's home to a lot of high achievers uh, as well, and yourself included. Yeah. Well, first of all, before I, I, I answer that question, let me just first of all say thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be here um, and, and appreciative of you guys listening to my story. Uh, I also want to, th uh, um, to acknowledge the uh, award recipients um, and uh, um, you know, congratulations to all of you and uh, also the team that's working over here. Um, it uh, really speaks to my heart to see you guys work so hard as so I wish you guys well um, on that. And uh, Ron uh, asked me to do this and he thought he was going to get up here by myself so he didn't know I was going well, to go up here. Well, actually, you know, it's so hard to get on her calendar. She's busy. So the only way I could get any time was to invite 200 people to <laughs> sit here. So, yeah, back yeah. at you. <laughs> um, so what I would say is, like, I, you know, I grew up in Central Los Angeles, um, and in Compton, in particular, home of NWA. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. and, and, you know, for me, look, uh, I think the way I sort of describe it is that many people sort of watch the movie, um, you know, Boys in Hood. I, I, that was my reality. I lived that. Um, and... Um, you know, look, I, I think there's a lot of positive things about L.A. There's also some things that, you know, uh, I'm glad that I, I don't, you know, I'm not, not in that anymore. But what I would say is that, um, you know, I loved L.A. for all that it taught me. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, most importantly, it's sort of the, the grit and determination of, um, of trying to sort of, you know, advance myself was something that came out of that environment. So, but uh, L.A. is real. Yeah, struggle, struggle, oh, absolutely. Struggle. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Now, you, uh, you came all the way across the country. Uh, to start your educational uh, journey. Howard University, why Howard? Oh, man. Um, so some of my colleagues heard me talk about Howard last Friday, so maybe a little bit, uh, you heard me say this before, but, um, you know, look, when I was growing up in the, in the 80s, there was a popular TV show called um, A Different World, um, and there was mm -hmm. Hillman College. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, for me, you know, Howard, uh, I, you know, when my father, when I was probably in the 11th grade or so, my father took me on a, a college tour um, and I had the opportunity to go to, my father was from, um, from Tennessee, so he took me a Fisk, of course. And then we went on to Spelman, um, but the last stop was mm -hmm. Howard University. And on that, on that uh, tour, you know, just being on the campus, um, having the opportunity to, to walk in and be and interact with the students, it was just an amazing experience, and I realized that that's where I belonged, um, that's where I should be. And so for me, it was about, 
it was about um, moving from LA and experiencing something differently, mm -hmm. uh, being in an environment where there are more people who look like me, um, you know, in that particular educational environment was something that was important to me. Um, but, you know, Howard has played an important role. Um, you know, people often ask me about, um, you know, my biggest accomplishments. And lots of people sort of think that it is, you know, becoming the first African-American CEO of a, of a REIT. But in reality, for me, it's, it's graduating from Howard. Mm, okay. um, because without Howard, there's nothing else. Um, because Howard instilled in me um, the foundation of who I would ultimately become. And that was something that was important to me and the foundation of, of ultimately. I, I found my, my love of, of finance at Howard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I developed a lot, a lot at, that, at the university. Okay, so, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Now you serve in some capacity uh, for Howard now, right? You're yeah. giving back to Howard. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I'm a trustee, um, and it is a labor of love for all of those who are in academia. It is a labor of love, um, and uh, I you know, enjoy the opportunity to help the school um, pivot um, you know, as, they, as they move forward. Um, you know, it's a, it's a gigantic institution with a lot of moving parts. So to see the institution from both a student perspective and now the trustee has been a rewarding experience. Okay, yeah. excellent. Now, continuing your educational journey, uh, your Harvard MBA, um, has that been beneficial, uh, the Harvard uh, experience? Yeah. You know, look, I think that, um, you know, education in general is important um, in terms of, you know, getting a, an advanced degree is always helpful no matter what institution you get it from. You know, I think that, as I said before, Howard was important to me because it laid the foundation. Harvard was important to me because it opened the doors. Um, and so I think each of them has played a role within my career. I think that, um, you know, Harvard gave me access that I might not have otherwise gotten. Okay, okay, excellent. So you, you worked at uh, GE, the finance at GE, um, Goldman Sachs, investment banking, M&A, uh, you could have, done anything from there. And people always ask, how did you end up in real estate? I like to phrase it a little bit differently. How did you choose real estate? Why did you pick real estate? You know, I, um, so my, my first love was finance. Um, and that is, a, you know, I took my first finance class at, at Howard and I love the concept of being able to sort of take a dollar and, and turn it into two. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a foundational thing for me. Um, when I went to GE, one of my first uh, rotations within the program was in the real estate group. And what I loved about um, real estate was that it was very tangible, right? We've all stayed in, um, you know, whether it's living in an apartment or, or stayed in a hotel or worked in an office building, we've all had that experience. And so I liked the fact that it was tangible. I liked the fact that it, it um, you know, put um, finance and real estate together, very mm -hmm. tangible, something very tangible with the numbers. Um, and so for me, it was like a perfect match. You know, was at, when I was at GE, I got a chance to do, you know, international and domestic real estate. And so marrying all of that and realizing that, you know, real estate, you can do it globally um, yep. and um, you can do it domestically as well as just the, the marriage of the finance and the numbers, uh, it, you know, just really sort of spoke to me and I, I, I loved it. Okay. Loved it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So 2005 comes along and you end up at RLJ. How did that come about? How did you end up at RLJ? You know, before I, um, uh, so in, in 2005, at the time I was working at GE, and I realized that, oh, I loved GE and I learned a lot, that ultimately um, I wanted to do something differently. I didn't know exactly what that was or what it looked like, and so I had kind of made a list of the 10 things that were important to me. At that time, I had worked about eight years in my young career. Um, and I think what's, what's important for the students to understand is that, you know, ultimately, understanding what you like and understanding what you don't like is equally as important. And so at that point in time, I'd made a list of the 10 things that were important to me. Um, and, and I did that work before I decided to, to, to leave GE. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had the opportunity to meet Tom Baltimore, who's now the CEO of Park, but the former CEO of RLJ, through Alan, mm -hmm. who was our, um, you know, our common mentor. And within five minutes of meeting Tom Baltimore, I knew exactly that this is the guy I wanted to work for. Because I'd already done the work. And I'd already done the work in terms of understanding that um, you, know, you can you can love the job and not like the people and you won't survive. But if you love the people and, and you don't, the job's okay, you'll survive. And so the number one thing for me um, in terms of my next job at the time was who I worked for. Um, and um, so I got a chance to meet Tom and I understood um, he was driven. I understand what he was trying to do with RLJ. Um, and so, and it happened to be in real estate, it was private equity. And so all the stars were aligned and I knew it within five minutes of meeting him that this is a guy that I, that I wanted to work for. 
Um, so between Alan in my ear and, uh, and getting a chance to meet Tom, that's, that's how I ended up at okay. RJ. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I introduced uh, Alan to Tom, so okay. I'm still waiting on my uh, referral fee okay. for you <laughs> right. getting that job. Get that fee, Okay, man. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so you spent uh, nine years as CFO, right? So you're not a newbie to uh, the C-suite. You spent nine years as CFO, two years as COO. How has that been helpful in, uh, you know, when you got into the top job? Um, it, it's been extraordinarily helpful because I, um, you know, I, I understand the business. I grew up in this at RLJ. I've been there for the last 16 years. And so having those different roles um, allowed me to, to see the business from different angles. Um, and you know, all roles lead that back to the balance sheet. So as mm -hmm. CFO, um, I got a chance to see you know, the business from a variety of different angles. Um, but I actually, I actually didn't want to be um, you know, CEO, uh, I'm CFO. You know, Tom came to me, I think I joined, I joined RLJ in 05. He came to me kind of halfway through my first year. And he said, I think this job can lead to you being um, CFO. And I politely said, no, thank you. Um, because in my, my uh, prior life, you know, CFO was somewhat of a, a back office um, mm -hmm. role, right? And nothing wrong with it, but it's not where I wanted to, to have my career. Um, and so I told him no. Um, he went home that night. Um, and he was so bothered by my response <laughs> that he, he came back the next day and he had a list of former CFOs who had become CEOs. That's Tom. Yeah. 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 And so I said, okay, let's rethink this. Um, and so it was really important to me that not just to be a CFO, because there's all kinds of CFOs. There, there are CFOs that are more support roles. There are CFOs that are capital markets. But it was important to me to be a strategic CFO and mm -hmm. to be on the front lines of the business in terms of everything that was happening and making sure that I was involved in every decision that occurred in the business and um, to be a partner to the CEO. Um, and so once he and I had that understanding, then I was able to move, in, move into that role in, in 2007, just two years after joining um, RLJ. Um, and so I think for me, it was important that um, to structure the, the role in a way that allowed me to see the business from a variety of different angles and to partner with the CEO. Uh, when I moved into COO role, it gave me the operating P&L experience. Sure. Um, to see the business from the boots on the ground um, perspective. So all of it was, you know, was extraordinarily hap uh, you know, helpful. And I, I would say that there isn't any element of my background that I don't use today um, mm -hmm. in, in the role today, whether it was my pre-RLJ experience, um, you know, my MBA experience from a leadership perspective, um, and it, everything that I've done in between. So all of it um, you know, becomes important as you sort of pull from every aspect of your, sure. Of your career. Sure. Now, the, the CEO uh, position itself, when did, you know, after you'd done, I guess, t 10, 11 years of uh, in the C-suite, did, was there some point where it became uh, feasible that you could actually become the CEO? How did that come about? Um, <laughs> Tom left. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, you know, look, being, being a CEO was never on my radar screen. I, I've never really been big on titles. Um, I'm really focused on opportunities and experiences and adding experiences to my toolkit. Um, and being in the room where decisions were made, it didn't mm -hmm. matter to me whether or not it was CEO, CFO, CEO. It was just being in the room where decisions were made. Um, and so I've always had sort of a um, sort of relaxed perspective around it. Sure. Um, you know, Tom left in 2016 to become the uh, CEO of, of Park um, as I was getting ready to spin out from Hilton, and it created an opportunity. Um, and so, you know, one thing that, that I've always done has been really focused on you know developing the skill sets that would propel you for the next level because you never know when the opportunity is going to present itself um, you know um, becoming CEO is never on my radar screen never a goal of mine um, but you know one thing that I was taught both at you know at Howard and at, at Harvard is that you always you know act like you're in the boardroom right mm -hmm. um, you always you know prepare for the next job you're not you're never working for the job that you're in you're always preparing for the next job and I think that though, that type of mentality and that, and that experience came through as I interacted with the board as CFO and as COO. Um, and, and so when the opportunity presented itself, um, and based on the experience that I had in the business, um, it was a natural next step for me. Sure. Um, and, and so at that point, you know, obviously my mind strategically positioned and said this is something that I, that I should fo focus on. Sure, yeah. sure, okay. Now, hindsight is always 2020. Um, you've had you know, incredible education, great companies, 
great jobs, uh, you know, the experience in the C-suite, et cetera. If you had it to look back on, is there anything you would have done differently? No, no, I, I think that you, um, I, I brace every aspect of my experience, so the good stuff and, and the failures, mm -hmm. um, because I've learned from every you know, mistake I've ever made. And um, you know, I, I reflect on, on if, I've, if I've made a mistake or if I've done something that I could have did differently. I reflect on it, but um, I take away the lessons and then I move on, I never look back. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I'm very, very much aware that all of those experiences, the good and the bad, um, has, has op positioned me to be where I, where I am okay. today. Okay, yeah, so. excellent, excellent. Um, now mentorship, we talked a little bit earlier about Alan being our common uh, mentor. Um, so obviously you're a big advocate of mentorship. How much of a role did that play, both Alan as well as others uh, along the way? Um, yeah, I mean, mentorship is imperative. Um, it's imperative if you're a student to get mentors and if you have the opportunity to mentor, it's imperative. Um, I am the collection of a lot of thoughts and people um, who've helped me along the way. Um, I've had ton of mentors and sponsors along the way. When I was in early in my career, um, you know, um, and, and I think the other thing about mentors is that they evolve over time. Um, mentors don't necessarily have to look like you um, or come from the same place that you came from. And so early in, in, my, in my career, um, most of my mentors were, were white males. Um, and they taught me the industry, they taught me the language. Um, and um, you know, really put me in a position to really understand where I was at. Um, after business school, um, you know, my mentors shift to mostly African American males, mm -hmm. um, and that's where Alan played, you know, a significant role um, in my career. And I think the distinction was well, early in my career, it was about technical knowledge. Um, later in my career, it was about how do you play the game? How do you play corporate America? How do you understand the nuances that are going to get you in the room? Who's going to advocate for you when you don't even know that you're being advocated? Who's going to open doors that you think are locked? Um, and that became differently. And then, you know, in the latter part of my career, as I moved in towards more of a, uh, in the C-suite area, my mentors have really shipped to women. Mm, okay. um, and so um, it really is sort of evolves and ebbs and flows, and you never know what role you're gonna play in someone else's career, what inflection point they're in. But, you know, at what I need now in my, in my career is more so less about the technical, less about doors that are open, but more about um, operating at this level when you're one of few or one of the only, and also managing the life balance, life component of it, the things that will that will that are different at this level, mm -hmm. and I think that um, women have played a gigantic role, um, you know, in my in my uh, in mentoring in the, in the latter part. But it's immensely important. Um, and uh, and Alan, um, who who uh, Ron talked about earlier, um, you know, changed the course of my life um, by making the introduction, but more importantly, by challenging and pushing me. You know, Alan asked me. I tell the story often, some of you may have read about it. You know, Alan asked me a very important question that, that changed me forever. Um, I was at my desk at Goldman Sachs and thinking about what I wanted to do um, you know, after that, and he said, mm -hmm. you know, what, are your, what are your peers doing? And I, I quickly went into this scenario, well, well you know, my, my classmates are doing this, and my, you know, my former colleague is doing this, and he said, stop. He said, um, you know, your, your, your peers are not the people who, um, are, who came from the same background. They're not the people who you went to school with. Your peers are individuals who are doing what you want to do. Um, and he immediately changed the, the way that I looked at the world, right? Because before I was looking left and right, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I started looking forward, I started looking up. And that really changed the trajectory of how I viewed myself, changed the trajectory of what I thought about and what I was focused on. And that's what mentors do, right? They, right. The mentors, they don't just sort of, they, they, they help you see yourself differently. Um, and that's what, he, that's what he did for me. Um, and so it was a very profound moment oh, for me. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so along the same lines of mentorship, you know, you've got a uh, significantly raised public profile, uh, great record of accomplishments. I would assume that you are sought after as a mentor. Uh, is that something that you have an opportunity uh, to do yourself now, the mentorship in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, I, I try to pay it forward often. Um, I got a whole table of people over there that I try to touch in some form of fashion. Um, you know, it, mentorship shows up in, mul in multiple ways. There is the traditional mentors where you meet with people all the time. 
Um, you know, I do that, some of that as well. I also do it from the standpoint of taking time to sort of pass along the nuggets that have been passed along to me. Um, and so I definitely um, take the time to do it. I don't get the chance to do it as often as I would like to. Um, but if I can't do it, then I connect people who can. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm constantly trying to touch people and pass along the advice um, that was given to me in some form or fashion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, you and I joked about this a little bit last week. We talked about balance um, and finding time. I mean, you're, uh, and most of us, I think, have struggled with this somewhere along the way. Uh, you're, you know, married 20 plus years, mother of four, uh, CEO, publicly traded company, uh, and you probably only get 24 hours in your day like the rest of us. So how does that work out? I mean, where do you, what's, what's the answer? I know you're probably still looking for it, but what do, you, yeah. what do you have to say about that? Well, first of all, you know, um, you know, I think that balance is a fallacy, right? It doesn't really exist. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think that you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. You know, um, we've heard people say that before, and, I, and I'm a believer of that. What I do believe is, is, is worth like flexibility, right? And meaning that, you know, do you have a role that provides you the opportunity that when you need to go do a, a kid event, um, a parent-teacher conference, that you have the flexibility to be able to do that? <laughs> um, and I think the other thing for me is having a partner who understands, um, you know, uh, who, who, who's a good partner in understanding the ebbs and flows of your business and what you have to do and the demands that are focused on it. Um, and so for me, it's been, Understanding that I don't, you know, balance is a fallacy. Flexibility is what I seek. Um, having a good partner, um, and then understanding, you know, that, you know, when, when I was at, when I was early in my career at GE, they they had this exercise that they had us do, and they had you write down your values. You wrote them down on these little index cards, um, and then they had you place them in order um, of what was what was important to you. Um, and the exercise basically said that, look, the order of these things is going to evolve over time. And understanding that, like, early in my career, I could live anywhere, you know, Schenectady, wherever GE took me. Later in life, that wasn't going to be possible. And really just sort of ingraining in your mind that your priorities will change over time and being okay with that, um, mm -hmm. I think, is ultimately, you know, what um, has allowed me to sort of to embrace it. I, you, know, um, you know, look, I... I have mommy guilt like everybody, right. every woman does, you know, in some form or fashion. Um, but I, I um, you know, I call my, my women mentors and say, how do I manage this, right? And they give me great advice. But I think, you know, ultimately it is just understanding that you can't do it all at the same time. You are gonna make mistakes and forgive yourself and kind of move on. Um, but, um, you know, I also understand that I love what I do. Every day I wake up and I love what I do. Um, I work six days a week. Um, five days for the company and one day for myself. But that's the way I grew up. My mother was an entrepreneur. My mother and father worked seven days a week. Um, and so that's what I know, right? And I know that when I'm home and I'm not working, because I tried that with my first kid, that didn't work. Um, so, um, you know, when I go back to work, everybody's happy. You know, mommy's happy, everybody's happy. Um, and, so, and so from that perspective, I think it's just really understanding what's important to you, being able to convey that and articulate it in a way um, that helps the whole, the whole family um, kind of understand that. And I'm really big on quality of time as opposed to quantity of time, mm -hmm. right, with, with, um, with my kids. Okay. Yeah. All right, great, great. Um, the, tonight's celebration is, uh, you know, celebrating innovation, entrepreneurship. Um, have you ever just thought about taking all of this corporate stuff and, you know, leaving it behind and, you know, Leslie Hale, LLC. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Um, and so, um, you know, I applaud those who, who do the entrepreneurial thing. Um, I think it is very difficult. Everybody's not cut out for it. You know, I watch my parents um, uh, work incredibly hard um, and do a phenomenal job um, as entrepreneurs. And what I learned at an early age, yeah, I, I like to tell people, like, I've been working since I was seven. I didn't start getting paid until I graduated from college, <laughs> but I'm working yeah. since I was seven right. because I, yeah. watched my, I watched my parents. And what I learned in that environment that entrepreneurialism is really hard um, and you really have to be cut out for it. And um, you, know, you worry about the lights being on, you worry about you know, payroll. And at an early age, I decided that, that I didn't want to worry about payroll, I just wanted to collect my check. <laughs> um, but, um, but what I didn't realize was that 
when you grow up this close to entrepreneurism, that it's always in your blood. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that was on that list that I talked about was being in an environment that was more entrepreneurial. Um, and so uh, while I didn't necessarily start RLJ, I, I did come into RLJ early enough that mm -hmm. it was very entrepreneurial, sure. right? There was yeah. a lot of white space. And so I had the best of both worlds. You know, I had an organization that was a real organization with a real balance sheet, but it was in its infancy. And so I got a chance to do something that was entrepreneurial, but in a way that was more conducive for me. Well, it wasn't, you know, worrying about the capital stack per se, but right. more worried about building the business out. Um, and so I feel like RLJ is entrepreneurial. We have a very entrepreneurial spirit. Um, it's an organization where you can come and put your stamp on it. Um, and you know, if you if you see a ball on the ground, pick it up and run with it. Worry about whose ball it is later. So I, I think that finding the environment that best fits your skill sets is is, is important and your mindset as well. Um, so I, I I applaud entrepreneurs. Um, I can never do a ground up you know, startup business, mm -hmm. but I could definitely work in that environment. And so I think that RLJ has fit that bill for for me. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. The uh, CEO job just uh, is inherently uh, difficult and fraught with challenges. What, did, what would you say has been your either past or future greatest challenge as it relates to uh, your work at RLJ? Look, I think ascending into the, the CEO role when you kind of work with your peers is challenging from the standpoint because now people used to be your peer now work for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also I'm a very hands-on, you know, involved person, so learning to sort of step back and allowing others to do um, and spending more time on a forward focus has been a challenge, um, you know, making that leadership shift. I think as a, as a CEO, you have the responsibility to, um, you know, set the vision for the organization and be able to articulate it in a way that people can get behind and rally behind it. Mm -hmm. You also have the responsibility of developing the strategy um, to, ex to execute on that vision, right, and being able to communicate that strategy. And then you have to be able to build a team that can execute on that strategy. And then you have to be able to create an environment that rewards and recognizes that team. Um, and I think that is a continuous loop um, that is um, a challenge no matter what the business context is, right? Whether, you know, we went from, you know, when uh, in 2016, you know, we, um, you know, we had a CEO change. Um, you know, founder left. It was a very challenging environment to sort of get your arms around. We then did the first, um, uh, uh, public to public um, merger in the in the yeah. um, in the hospitality space, which is very challenging. We integrated that business in 2018. We had another CEO switch um, in 2018 was when, when I took over, and then we've been transforming our business, um, you know, in 2019. And now we position ourselves with significant capital, and now we're in a very you know very tumultuous time period mm -hmm. for uh, for the lodging space because we're a travel business. Right. But despite all of those things vision, strategy, people, environment, having to do that in that context is, is continuous. Um, and so leading in an environment in an industry where you know, the, there's a paradigm shift, not a cyclical shift, but a paradigm shift is very challenging. But if you can do those things wherever you're at, vision, strategy, people, context, you can manage through all of those things. Okay. All right, excellent, yeah. excellent. The, uh, just switching to current, current events, I guess just a little bit as we talk about challenges uh, and the coronavirus that's with us all here. Um, how is that impacting um, RLJ? How is that impacting, I guess the, you know, the industry is obvious, but RLJ in particular, yeah. um, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, I think that obviously the lodging industry is, is severely impacted. We have 100, and three hotels, uh, you know, across the U.S. in 20 different states, um, and so we are, you know, being impacted from a standpoint of the demand that's in the market. That's obviously coming down pretty mm -hmm. dramatically. Um, you know, over the weekend, I spent my entire weekend um, dealing with the fact that we had, um, you know, an impact within our hotels, and so I was on the phone every hour um, discussing, you know, the fact that we had a, a, a client, um, a customer who was in the building who was, um, you know, had the virus and, um, and what we were gonna do about it. Because my first priority in that point isn't the operating side of the business, it's more, it's my guests and it's my employees. And so, um, you know, fundamentally and from the root, that is my priority. Um, the business is gonna be impacted, right? And we're seeing a falling demand, we're seeing a falling revenues, um, and then we have a fixed cost base that we have to cover. Right. Um, but, 
if you focus on True North, which is to take care of your, your customers and your employees first, the other pieces will work themselves mm -hmm. out. The reality of it is, is that um, you know, we're in the thick of things right now, um, but the thing that gives me hope about our business and about um, our country is that if you look statistically speaking at you know, the flu, I think ultimately once we kind of get our arms around the situation, we'll move into a mindset that's related, more akin to our perspective about the flu. I'm confident that that will ultimately happen. I don't know when and how long mm -hmm. it's going to ultimately right, take. Right. So our business will come back. Um, but in the meantime, within the thick of this, it's, it's taking care of our employees and taking care of our guests is the most important thing for us. And the business side will work itself out. But we are seeing a significant impact. Um, we're going to be impacted. Airlines are going to be impacted. And obviously, cruise lines are going to be impacted as well. And we're going to lag. Right? So even when this thing sort of works itself out, people, it's going to take a while for people to kind of get back into traveling and feel uncomfortable. You know, right now, half the people tonight shook hands and half the people didn't shake hands. Mm -hmm. And even after that, it's going to take a while for us to get back to shaking hands. Um, and so I think, um, you know, this is something that's going to be around for the next couple of months. And particularly for lodging, we're moving into spring break right. over the next, you know, um, two months here. And so it's a, it's a significant part of our mm -hmm. business, particularly in the leisure components of it. And that's, I mean, people are canceling left and right. Um, so it, that part is what it is, and we are where we are. But we have to take care of employees and, and, and the guests. Okay. Okay. Um, I know there are several chapters that still need to be written, but when you think about your legacy, what do you, what do you hope to leave as a, a legacy? Um, you know, I think um, there's lots of different pieces to that. One is um, to be a leader who led by example. Um, you know, I haven't asked and I wouldn't ask anyone to do anything that I haven't done myself or to work as hard. Um, when I haven't done that myself. Mm -hmm. um, I think that as a, as, a, as a woman, as a woman of color, um, I want to leave a legacy of having open door for more women, open doors for more women and for minor, more minorities. That's important to me. Um, the one thing that I love about RLJ is that it is an organization that looks past race and gender and focuses on your talent. It is a true meritocracy. Um, and the one thing I like about the lodging industry is that um, you know, it is an industry where we've got a variety of different facets where women and minorities can thrive. Um, you know, whether it is a brand company and a management company or an ownership company, there's so many different facets in which, um, uh, you know, there's opportunity um, for people to play lead, leading roles within that. Um, so that's important um, to me. I think that from a perspective of, of, of women, um, I hope that I can be a role model to them. Um, you know, uh, you know, there are lots of people who want to be on this side of the world in terms of the C-suite, and my advice to them would be that, you know, you got to stay on the revenue side of the business. I think that oftentimes, um, you know, women are, and this is a little bit controversial, but I'm saying it anyway because I'm controversial. Okay. Um, you know, oftentimes that women are encouraged to take support roles, and those roles are important, and they're meaningful for the business, and somebody's going to do them um, and do them well, and they contribute, and, and they're important but they're not necessarily gonna to lead to you being on the C-suite side of the business. And so my hope in terms of my legacy is to demonstrate to women that we can be on the revenue side of the business and that that role can ultimately lead to being um, in the C-suite. Okay, okay. That sounds like Alan Braxton there. Stay close to the money, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> very much so. It's, it's true for whatever industry you're in though, yeah. right? If you're in Cisco, you wanna be on the engineer side, right? You wanna be Google, you wanna, mm -hmm. you don't wanna be you know, in the back office. No, so, absolutely. Um, so, no, yeah, I couldn't, stay agree. Close to couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Um, it wasn't Alan, but yeah, it was okay. Alan-esque. That sounds, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't Alan, yeah. So. Um, well, this has been great here. Um, one of the things I think that is probably the best compliment, and uh, I spent some time talking to your team members uh, over there, and I think they echo this, uh, is that when I run into people who've known you for years, uh, watched your ascension um, as to where you are today, one of the best compliments that I always hear is that, uh, and even though you're busy, you don't return my calls, my emails, or anything, um, is that when you do finally catch up with Leslie, Leslie is still Leslie. So, um, and I think that's probably, with all of your accomplishments uh, and having known you all of these years, that's probably, uh, you know, one of the most complimentary things I think can be said, and the culture that you have set at RLJ um, reflects that just from talking uh, to your team there. So I uh, really appreciate you taking time to come out here. And it's unfortunate I had to have everyone else here show up just to get on your calendar. 
but thanks a lot. Okay, that's great. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ron and Leslie, that was, uh, that was really outstanding. Leslie, you really can't do the Leslie Hale LLC thing because then you would have to deal with all the people in the room that would want to come work for you. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again. Uh, so right now, uh, we're going to move on to uh, the awards. And uh, Ken Ullman is going to help us with that. So if you haven't met Ken, Ken is the Chief Strategy Officer for Economic Development at the University of Maryland and the uh, president of the Terrapin Development Company. But if you know Ken, yes, if you know Ken, uh, uh, he's responsible for all the really terrific things happening around campus. So really, you should have like a shorter business card like the man, because he's the man. So all the things you see happening up and down Route 1, <laughs> truly, yes. Uh, you can thank, uh, thank Ken for that. So Ken's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on around campus, around College Park, and then he's going to introduce our honorees. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Oh, we shook hands. Uh-oh. Man, how... um, thank you very much, Tom. Um, thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, let me just say real quick, um, uh, I know it's been a long night. I think I'm probably the only person between you and the award, so I'm going to be brief. But I also just want to thank um, uh, uh, Ronald and Leslie for your wonderful conversation. And thank you again to your, for being here, and congratulations on your success. And um, uh, all your answers were great, but especially your answer on work-life balance and flexibility. I know we're all um, taking notes on that one, especially our new president, who I heard taking notes, trying to, you know, new role. Um, uh, by the way, uh, before I break some, make some brief comments, um, let me again, we don't, I don't think we need another standing ovation, although you can if you want, but let me just lead another round of applause for uh, Dean Pines, our incoming uh, president of the university. And as I, as I do that, um, you know, Tom's introduction was um, way over the top with me. Uh, you know, I get to give speeches about the great work we're doing um, with an amazing team that delivers uh, the results um, with the leadership of a university. And these things don't happen without uh, a president with a vision. And we are so excited to have a president who's been on this campus since 1995, knows this campus, knows what we're about, and knows where we're heading. So, uh, Daryl, it's an honor to, to, to be here with you tonight, and thank you for your, your leadership. Um, I know uh, it's getting late, um, and so let me just fly through a few things. Um, some of you have seen probably lots of this before. Uh, if you haven't, um, uh, welcome. But um, we are um, working very hard on behalf of the university, the Anchor Institution, to create Greater College Park, to create the great university community, to complement the great university. And so, um, how do we do that? Well, we need to explain it to folks. Uh, so, we came up with Greater College Park, and to do that, and it's a little bit awkward for me, so if I keep turning around, I apologize. I'm kind of looking in that corner, but you're looking up there. Um, so in the red dynamic academic space, you've got to have a great campus. And we have that, and we're adding new buildings. Some of them were mentioned uh, recently. In the green, you've got to have uh, a vibrant community, the kind of place you want to live, you want to bring your business, you want to shop, you want to recreate, you want to be a part of. And then the blue, we need to have lots of jobs, this public-private research enterprise. We need lots of people here, living here, uh, working here, and being a part of this community. And so... How are we doing this? This is the geography, and I won't belabor it, but um, just the area that we're really focused on. Um, and you know this area, you know the campus, but to the top is the Beltway, 495, 95 pop it in the top. The yellow line is, and you've heard me say this before, it's not Route 1, it's Baltimore Avenue. And soon when the SHA rebuild of Baltimore Avenue, the complete street begins, it will begin to feel like Baltimore Avenue and not uh, Route 1 even, even more. The area in red is the land owned by the university. And what you see is when we think about campus, we think about the area mainly to the west of Baltimore Avenue, where we are now. But we're really working to activate that area that we now call our Discovery District, which stretches to the uh, east side of Baltimore Avenue around our hotel and the area there, back to the area around the metro uh, where we have uh, a big part of our Discovery District. And you see that dotted purple line. And I know those of you in real estate have spent a lot of time hearing about, thinking about the purple line. Now that it's under construction, we are spending a lot of time figuring out how that connects us in a much more robust, strong way to our neighbors, both to get to our metro, to zip down on the green line and now the yellow line uh, into DC, but also to New Carrollton, the Amtrak stop, and the Metro Hub, Silver Spring, and Bethesda. 
And one of the things that uh, most people don't know is that five of the 21 stops on the Purple Line are on our campus, and we negotiated with the state a fair free zone for anyone with a university ID. So it's essentially within those five stops becoming our internal shuttle as well, allowing faculty and students to get to the metro, to get to our Discovery District for internships, mentorships, et cetera. So we're really excited about this. A couple images. This is what the Purple Line's gonna, gonna look like. Um, I think, yep, there it is. Um, that's what the complete street project is. So if you know the area, all the utility relocation has taken place. And now from Greenbelt Road through the south gate of campus, you are actually going to see a complete street project uh, built. All the right of way was, was assembled. And so you'll see new landscape medians and landscape new sidewalks and crosswalks and uh, protected bike lanes and, yes, scooter lanes uh, uh, as well. And then lastly, just showing the metro uh, map, the, connect, the extension of the yellow line to parallel the green line to share those tracks was also very important for us because now on one line, you can get right to Reagan National Airport. You can get to uh, a little company from Seattle building its second headquarters. Um, and so that connectivity is really important for our students, our faculty, um, to be able to experience uh, all that is uh, uh, DC and accessible. Plus, we have the Mark train up to the Camden line up to our uh, partners at the University of Maryland Baltimore uh, by Camden Yards as well. So back to um, dynamic academic spaces. The only real slide I want to focus on is that you see these new projects. And one of the things that uh, many of these projects have in common is that we're working hard to drive energy to the main street. So if you want to activate the main street, put your buildings as close to the main street as possible. So the Arib Center, um, and for those of you, that's the middle picture, the location of the Arib Center, right next to engineering, next to Clark Hall, biomedical engineering, driving energy to the main entrance and across to our Discovery District, that's one of the reasons why Capital One put their National Technology Innovation Center uh, in our Discovery District. That's why Amuta and WeWork and all the companies in WeWork are there because they wanted access. Adobe has a software research lab. They want access to the students and faculty coming out of engineering and computer science. The public policy building, which is under construction uh, across from the Purple Line stop as well, and you can see in this image on the upper left the public policy building, uh, and then on the lower uh, left is Clark Hall, and then the Arib Center you saw as well, on our new basketball performance center. So really strategic about the way we're locating buildings for the effect of, our surround, of the connection to our surrounding community, and that's really important. So that, that wonderful community, well, one, the, the thing we're focused on right now is these nodes along Baltimore Avenue. We can't tackle all of, I'd say, Route 1 in the past tense uh, at once, but we can focus on these core areas. And so this area just north of Main Gate, uh, I think when the Varsity and the View were, were first built, they felt a little bit isolated, but now we were able to acquire that old holdout little liquor store, Route 1 Liquors, and uh, get our friends from Vigilante Coffee in Hyattsville to come up and do their second store. And now I've, I've seen uh, students taking Instagram pictures uh, in front of the Vigilante Coffee sign, and I'm pretty sure that didn't happen in front of Number 1 Liquors, although who knows. Um, the, 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 the Cambria Hotel, you know, it's easy now to show the pictures of the Cambria with Orange Theory and College Park Grill. That was the vacant Coons Ford auto dealership for 15 years. Um, where, the, where the new Lidl grocery store, which is a great affordable option for our students in the community, that was a older dilapidated motel that, uh, that came down uh, for that as well. So a lot of progress there. And then in downtown College Park, um, we are really excited about the progress uh, here, make sure I get my bearings. So if you can see, there are four projects I just want to mention really quickly. Um, the, the top one where it says City Hall is the new City Hall. Um, shocking that that has the name on it, if you can see that. Um, that's something that we're really proud of. And by the way, that is, I didn't have the before picture here because we were trying to consolidate, but that is at Baltimore Avenue and Knox Road. Um, Knox and Lehigh, and if those of you know, there used to be a city hall, that came down two weeks ago, and the retail frontage comes down either tomorrow or uh, the next couple days, and we are doing, believe it or not, a joint venture with the city of College Park. This is the only place in the country where we can find the Anchor University doing a joint venture with the municipality to build a new city hall, but together we knew we could deliver something that we couldn't necessarily do individually, so great public square, public plaza, the Terrapin Development Company will lease up the retail to activate the street. Um, and then there will be two stories of City Hall, Glaston City Council Chambers overlooking the plaza, two stories of a university office building. Um, up to the right, that's another joint venture with the city where that was a vacant 
uh, elementary school that was vacant for a long time, and now it's under construction as a child care facility, also a joint venture uh, with the city. Uh, and then, uh, very importantly, on the bottom right, I'm not just saying that because the Bizzuto team is sitting right there, um, but that is our partnership with Bizzuto that will close later this month, delivering 62,000 square feet of retail, a new extended Calvert Street um, with 400 residential units geared for faculty and staff uh, and folks that work in our Discovery District. So we will have two projects within a block and a half of one another under construction uh, later this month. Further down, the Whole Foods anchored Riverdale Park Station with Denison's Brewing, uh, townhomes, and then there, there's a bridge that goes over the tracks connecting to our Discovery District. And then further in Hyattsville, we really think of ourselves as neighbors and partners uh, in this corridor. Um, and then one of the things, we really work hard on um, the public realm. So if you've been on Baltimore Avenue coming from the south, from Hyattsville direction, You've seen a brand new mural that went up a couple months ago. That's in a partnership with the city of College Park. We're really excited about our commitment to public art. Um, on the left is our public charter school, the College Park Academy that was launched and had its first graduating class last year, grades six through 12. And then on the bottom right, we have a Live Near Your Work program and that's one of our employees uh, taking a picture in front of uh, his family's new home. We just hit our 60th home purchase uh, with our Live Near Your Work incentive program for university employees. And then the last subject is the uh, public-private research hub. So um, you see we're focused on the area around the hotel. Um, we just, uh, our WeWork is uh, uh, going very well. I think there's one spot left. Uh, really exciting to see the diversity of companies that are there. We painted the old white fuel tanks that, uh, if you haven't been, uh, we're really excited about. Uh, and most importantly, uh, and not because Scott's sitting here at all, uh, is uh, the Hall CP, which is our brand new uh, food hall, restaurant, uh, venue space that um, the after party, I believe, is at the hall. Uh, I was just told by Scott. Um, there, there will also be a bachelor watch party, I'm told as well. So uh, for those of you who need to get to the bachelor finale, I thought that would have more loud. I didn't, I didn't deliver that as well as I, I have to work on my delivery. It just didn't happen the way I thought. Um, and obviously our hotel, and then we've got the leased up space there. This image, by the way, um, we are, we are, we've just selected a development partner to build, to bring new buildings out of the parking lot adjacent to our hotel. Um, so this is an image of those lots, and these are images of what you will find, symbolic of the kind of buildings that you will find brought out of the ground that will surround our hotel over the next few years. I'll have more information uh, next year uh, on this. Um, further back uh, in our Discovery District, uh, new construction from Corporate Office Properties Trust, 100,000 square foot building delivers in August. Uh, half of it's already leased to uh, a number of great companies. Uh, and this is my last slide, I'll end here. This is, uh, to a large extent, the proof uh, positive that uh, over the last 18 months, all of these companies have moved into our Discovery District, um, a number of them within the WeWork, but all of these companies together represent 1,300 new private sector jobs to this community, to Prince George's uh, County, and uh, the connection, all of these companies have some connection to the university, an alum, a faculty member, and they're not in one industry. They're quantum computing, they're drones, their aero threads makes thermal blankets that wrap satellites, their cybersecurity, Adobe Capital One, et cetera. So we feel like we're onto something big, and I just wanted to say thank you to so many of you in this room who have helped us with these projects, either directly or indirectly with guidance. Uh, we're really excited about the direction, and we, uh, are, frankly, are just getting started. So with that, uh, I want to say thank you uh, again. And I'm going to bring Maria up, uh, back up, and we're going to get the award started. All right. I just want to take a minute uh, to make an announcement. Uh, as you know, this event, as well as many others, are supported by the Colvin Institute of Real Estate Development. We lost John Colvin, the donor that established the Institute a few, few years ago, and he is really sorely missed. Uh, however, his legacy lives on through the Colvin Institute. John's wife, Karen, wanted us to further his leg legacy by establishing the John B. Colvin Student Leadership Award. So tonight, I announced the inaugural John B. Colvin Student Leadership Award of $2,000. And that award goes to Sarah Ingerson. 
she doesn't know that we're <laughs> giving this to her. Um, the school, the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation has 14 dual degree uh, programs, uh, and uh, Sarah is will be our first graduate with a dual degree in Community Planning and Real Estate Development. She'll be graduating, yes, she'll be graduating at the top of her class this semester. Uh, and she's been working in the planning real estate development industries for several, several years, first as a planning intern for the Carroll County Department of Planning, then as a legislative aide for the Maryland Gen General Assembly and development intern for Urban Atlantic, and now she is development assistant for Urban Atlantic. Uh, so Sarah, I just want to give you, you this award, and uh, you have been a true leader in the program, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're on to the awards. Um, I wanted to uh, first say I know um, that our first recipient um, uh, had some travel schedule uh, changes because of uh, the coronavirus, um, and so is not here uh, this evening, but I'm gonna read uh, a bit about uh, uh, the first honoree um, tonight. We have three this evening. The first one, um, who again, uh, couldn't be here tonight, um, are uh, Eugene Ford Sr. Uh, posthumously, and his son, Eugene Ford Jr., um, who, uh, Eugene C Sr. was the founder and owner of three dynamic companies. He founded Mid-City Financial Corporation in 1965. Mid-City is a family-owned and mission-driven company, firmly rooted in the pioneering spirit, 50 years of excellence in the development, acquisition, oversight, and management of multifamily housing and mixed-use real estate. He then founded Edgewood Management Corporation in 1973, sister company to Mid-City and the seventh largest affordable housing property management company in the United States. During his 45-year career as a developer, operator, and financier of affordable housing, served as an inspiration and the source of vision when he founded Community Preservation Development Corporation in 1989. He was the... <laughs> he was also the founder and chairman of the Institute for Responsible Housing Preservation, served on a multitude of boards, some of which are set forth in your program, and was chairman of the Governor's Committee on Policy for Housing Working Families in Maryland. Of great significance to the real estate development program is that Eugene Sr. was one of the founding donors for the Masters of Real Estate Development Program at the University of Maryland. That deserves another round of applause. Eugene Jr. currently serves as chairman of the board and controlling stockholder of Mid-City Financial Corporation and Edgewood, and Edgewood Management Corporation. Mid-City is one of the largest privately held owners of affordable housing on the East Coast. Edgewood Management Corporation currently manages 32,000 units in the DMV. For all their efforts to improve the community for decades of innovative and impactful real estate projects and for their contribution to the University of Maryland, it is with great pleasure that we present Eugene Ford Sr. and Eugene Ford Jr. with a 2020 Maryland Award for Innovation Entrepreneurship in Real Estate. And again, they couldn't be here tonight, so let's join in another round of applause. Our next uh, recipient uh, is Michelle Hagens. Uh, who unfortunately recently had a uh, serious uh, accident. Uh, however, uh, Cell Bernardino will be receiving uh, her award on her behalf. And Cell, are you here? Are you able to join on stage? Would you come up and join me, please? And while you're, while you're coming up, I will read a bit about, uh, about Michelle and then ask you to say a few words on her behalf. Michelle is president and CEO of Fort Lincoln Newtown Corporation, Fort Lincoln Realty Company. Led by Michelle, an accomplished developer and community leader, Fort Lincoln Newtown Corporation, now 45 years old, is the exclusive developer of Fort Lincoln Newtown, a 1,500-unit master plan community located on 360 acres of high rolling land on the edge of the District of Columbia, bordering Prince George's County. 
The Fort Lincoln community includes a sprawling Costco anchored shopping center, the only Costco in the District of Columbia, and hundreds of townhomes, senior units, and condos. I think we've all seen that uh, on, on uh, New York Avenue and, and um, are really uh, impressed with it. Uh, Michelle represents one of the few women and only a fraction of African American women to impact commercial development in our field. As an individual developer, entrepreneur, and through strategic partnership alliances, Michelle has left her mark on almost every quadrant of the District of Columbia. In addition to her development activities, Michelle is an ordained minister. She was ordained to the priesthood in 2007 and has been a lifelong member of the Episcopal Church. Michelle's highly educated has earned four degrees from Howard University and one from George Washington University. She's a certified property manager and a licensed real estate broker. She's been honored with numerous awards and sits on several boards of companies and entities, including the Federal City uh, Council. For all that Michelle has done to plan and build a safe and decent community for the residents of the District of Columbia and for significant contributions to our city, it is our pleasure to present the 2020 Maryland Award for Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Real Estate to Michelle Hagen. Sell. Would you please briefly share some thoughts about Michelle with us? Mm -hmm. So as you might imagine, um, there are unique challenges with working for someone who's both an accomplished real estate developer and an ordained minister. Good evening. Uh, Michelle obviously can't be here today. I'm pinch hitting. I am Sal Bernardino, Vice President of Development and Construction at Fort Lincoln Newtown Corporation. I want to thank the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, the Colvin Institute of Real Estate Development, the Robert H. Smith School of Business, the James A. Clark School of Engineering, and a special thank you to Maria Day Marshall and her team for this award. I want to congratulate all of the honorees, and I want to thank two of our long-term partners at Fort Lincoln, uh, the Trammell Crow Company, represented here by Adam Weirs, and the uh, Concordia Group. They've been with us through many of these large projects. Okay. Michelle would tell you that she doesn't just build houses, she builds community. Under her leadership and perseverance, Fort Lincoln has become a mix of affordable and market rate residences, including condominiums, multifamily buildings, fee simple townhomes, and subsidized apartments for seniors. The shops at Dakota Crossing at Fort Lincoln, 400,000 square feet with the district's only Costco and Lowe's stores. It is a green shopping center with extensive low income, I'm sorry, um, extensive low impact development measures. And it combines um, regional destination shopping like Costco and Lowe's with small shops and restaurants that the people living in the area can walk to. Fort Lincoln Newtown was originally the idea of President Lyndon B. Johnson. That's how far back it goes. He wanted a model new town within a major city that would be racially and economically integrated and inspire other such projects with hope that they could collectively revitalize the nation's urban centers. I also want to acknowledge the decades-long partnership with the U.S. Housing, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development and the District of Columbia. Working with them, uh, we were able to do all that you've seen at uh, Fort Lincoln. And I want to assure you that Michelle is not finished. We have more residential development in the pipeline. We're looking at uh, possibly medical facilities, uh, additional retail is coming. And all of them are uh, a result of Michelle's commitment to improve the community at Fort Lincoln Newtown. Again, it is an honor to receive this award for her, and thank you.
And last but certainly not least, our third recipient tonight is Jire Lynch, the president and CEO of Jire Lynch Real Estate Partners. Would you come up and join us here? It is an honor to have you. Um, I'm honored to call you a friend and welcome you to the podium. Uh, now I'm going to read this amazing uh, bio uh, briefly. Um, after a stellar career as a gymnast and Olympian, I, you know, I mean, <laughs> hey, if I won an Olympic silver medal, I would expect people to put that in my bio. Um, I would never have won anything in the Olympics. Uh, and after earning a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering and a Bachelor of Arts in Urban Design from Stanford University, Jair decided that he would try his hand at real estate development. He applied the same standard of excellence that he employed in athletics and academics to development. He founded his firm, Jair Lynch Real Estate Partners, in 1998. He's completed more than 65 projects totaling almost 4.3 million square feet of development with an additional 1.7 million square feet in the pipeline. He's been a driving fo force for urban regeneration, working to create walkable urban places to empower people, develop place, and create prosperity. Jire's projects have won several awards, including the NHB 2017 Multifamily Pillars of the Industry Award and the Best Mid-Rise Apartment Community, the Crew DC Placemaking Award, Washington Business Journal's Community Impact Award, Urban Finalist for Affordable Housing Finance Reader's Choice Award, and more. He's developed diverse community-oriented projects such as libraries, affordable multifamily housing, community health centers, food bank facilities, student housing, public charter schools, museums, recreation centers, a unified communication center, and embassies. Which embassies? Thought, thought, I thought that was going to be your answer. Uh, he's also developed more traditional projects, including condominiums, office buildings, market rate rental housing, and mixed-use retail for his extraordinary and pioneering work in developing challenged neighborhoods in the District of Columbia, his undying concern for the less fortunate residents of the district, and his entrepreneurial spirit and skills that have grown his organization. We are honored to present Jire Lynch with the 2020 Maryland Innovation Entrepreneurship in Real Estate Award. Congratulations. So I, I want to say thank you to everyone in the room. It is late, everyone is anxious, uh, and I will just say a couple of words. One, thank you to the University of Maryland. Uh, you have been part of our growth over the last 20 years. Um, not sure if you know it, but Tony Start, uh, Malcolm Haith, Ramiz, uh, Romy Apt, there are plenty of talent that came from the University of Maryland, started working with us, saw a vision, um, as my good friend Leslie Hale has said, you start with a vision, your strategy, and then you have to get to people. And University of Maryland has provided us people that has allowed to fuel our ideas, and our ideas have been able to create extraordinary places. So I want to thank the university for this award. And there's so many other folks in, in the audience that we've worked with that are connected to the university, uh, whether it's architects, engineers, one of my good friends, Matt Bell, and many others who are allowing us to uh, take our ideas, get them in paper, get them up, uh, and so that people can really experience some extraordinary places. So I want to thank everyone uh, for the award tonight. Thanks. And ladies and gentlemen, back to Tom Burton. get that applause because I get to tell you to go home. Uh, so this has been a great night. Thank you to all of you for being here tonight, uh, especially thanks uh, to our speakers, uh, Leslie and Ron, that was terrific. Uh, thanks and congratulations to our honorees and thanks for our past honorees for being here. Uh, uh, Don and uh, Daryl, thank you for uh, your hosting all this with us. Um, and to our honorees, uh, both past and present, thanks for all the great things you do just to make the built environment this is really a better place for us, so thank you. So we'll see you back here on March 9th, 2021. Uh, have a good night, drive safely, wash your hands. Thank you.